Hi, I'm Sarish Sudhakaran and let me show you some of the cool cinematic techniques of Dunkirk. What's so special about Dunkirk? It is one of the highest resolution Hollywood movies ever shown to audiences theatrically. 70% of it was shot on IMAX film and the rest on 65mm. Why shoot IMAX? In simple terms, the single most unique thing about true film IMAX is its resolution. Just to clarify, I'm not talking about digital IMAX or the brand IMAX, but IMAX 1570 film. If you want the details on frame sizes and aspect ratios, I'll link to an article I wrote on the subject. You'll find it below. An IMAX film frame is roughly 7 times the size of a Super 35mm film frame, without any crops. A Super 35mm film frame has a maximum theoretical resolution of 4K at its best. Practically, it's a lot lower due to various issues. In context, an IMAX frame is roughly 2.8 times that, so you get about 11K. Digital cameras are getting close, but as of today, nothing beats the resolution of IMAX. We're talking about a maximum of 85 megapixels per frame. I was lucky enough to watch many IMAX movies in a dome theater while it lasted. The film spools are huge, the projector is huge, but the most important part of IMAX is the screen. You have to see it to believe it. The immersive quality of IMAX is undisputed, provided the screen is large enough. The whole idea of increasing resolution is so the screens can get larger, but the audience is still sitting at the same distances from the screen. Additionally, IMAX also increases the vertical height with an aspect ratio of 1.43 to 1, so the immersive experience is complete. This physical change in relationship between the audience and the screen affects many aspects of filmmaking. The way you place subjects in the frame is different. In Dunkirk, you can see a lot more headroom than normal. On a regular screen, your eyes are roughly at the center of the screen, but in IMAX, it's a lot lower. If the size of a close-up occupied the entire height, you would have a sore neck by the end of the movie. The rule of thumb for IMAX for a long time has been the shot size is always 1 up to super 35mm. For example, a traditional close-up becomes a medium shot on IMAX. A long shot in IMAX is as good as a medium shot on super 35mm. The extra advantage of this is you also get a lot of the background, which adds to the immersion. Most of Dunkirk is in the medium shot, with an 80mm lens. This is Christopher Nolan's favorite lens. He even has a personal copy for his own use. The cinematographer Hoyte van Hoytema also prefers roughly the same focal length, which would be the equivalent to approximately a 40mm lens in full frame 35mm. In addition to resolution, the second change IMAX brings to the table is change in the depth of field. Most of Dunkirk was shot at a T8, which would roughly equate to the same depth of field as you would get at T2.8 on Super 35. Hoytema prefers to shoot wide open, so this would also get the shallow depth of field look both Nolan and Hoytema loves. By the way, I have a really cool video that goes in-depth into the cinematography of Hoytema and Hoytema. Check it out in the description. You'll see many of his techniques used in Dunkirk as well. IMAX also forces you to move the camera differently. You can't shake the camera like you do in Super 35 because you would induce motion sickness in the audience due to the immersive quality of IMAX. That's why Dunkirk is mostly filled with slow steady moves. Whenever the footage is handheld, it is short and minimal. The vast majority of the shots on land and the air were in IMAX and most of the shots in the pleasure boat, Moonstone, were shot on 65mm film. The reason why they didn't use IMAX for these scenes was mostly so they could record audio. IMAX cameras are loud, so are not suitable for dialogue, and Nolan hates ADR. By this point you have a very valid question. If film IMAX is so cool, why don't we have theaters showing it? Most film IMAX screens shut a long time ago, for economical reasons. What Nolan is trying to do is revive the format, showing people how the immersive quality of IMAX makes it worthwhile. A reason for moviegoers worldwide to return to cinema screens instead of sitting at home in front of Netflix. The reason I mention this is because there's a running joke about watching Dunkirk the way it was intended to be seen. The sad part is you can't, and Nolan knew it when he shot it. Here's a quick list. For more details, you might want to read the article. Film IMAX is 11K with an aspect ratio of 1.43 to 1. The Moonstone scenes are 2.2 to 1. This was for film IMAX projection only. For digital IMAX, the film was scanned to 8K, so not the same thing. 
For Super 35 film and digital projection, which is what most audiences saw, the immersive quality is lost, and the aspect ratios are mostly 2.39 to 1 and 2.2 to 1. Cinematographer Heute van Heutema did account for all of this while shooting, but the fact is, most of the world, an overwhelming majority, didn't see the movie the way it was shot. And now we have the Blu-ray version, which crops to another aspect ratio. The IMAX shots are now cropped to 16 by 9, and the Moonstone shots are 2.2 to 1. This is what you're seeing in this video. I hope you understand why it was important to tell you this. The format changes the way you feel about the movie. What do you think? Does this affect your viewing experience? Let me know in the comments below. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's explore some of the cool techniques of Dunkirk, starting with camera angles. Dunkirk is about survival. Everyone's trying to get away, and people are saving each other. Nolan tells the story in three parts, the land, sea, and air. The activities on land take about a week, on sea about a day, and in air about an hour. Things happen along different timelines at the beginning and converge at the end. The location is Dunkirk in France, and 400,000 men wait to be saved by boats to cross over to England, which is home. And you can practically see it from here. What? Home. Home is the common element, the goal. This is represented very powerfully by the horizon. The horizon is omnipresent in Dunkirk, right from the very first shot. For most of the movie, the horizon is dead center, splitting the screen in half. Not only was this effective for IMAX, but in a way, it also tells a unique story on its own. Whenever the situation is calm and steady, the horizon is level. Most of the scenes on land where events play out over a longer period have the horizon level. When things get tense, the horizon starts wavering. In the Moonstone sequences at sea, the horizon is more active. This is both logical and by design. The events happen over a shorter period. There's more urgency. In air, the horizon goes all the way to 90 degrees sometimes. I don't want to reveal any spoilers, but the Spitfires are the key to this plot. The battle is effectively in the air. Though ultimately for the pilots too, it's about survival. The next thing you notice is the framing. Most are mid shots, with a little more headroom than usual due to the IMAX screen. In addition, you'll notice Nolan has used over the shoulder shots as a sort of point of view shot, so we witness things as if you're right behind the character. Cameras are placed on stretchers, on Spitfires, and on boats, because ultimately the goal for Nolan was to immerse us in the story in a physical sort of way. They chose maximum depth of field so we are always aware of the surroundings. In dialogue close-ups, shallow depth of field is used because as we get closer, it gets more shallower, even at higher T-stops. The only exception is in those scenes of rare calm and contemplation when we go back to shallow depth of field as a temporary release to the protagonists, a moment of peace before the next test for survival. Christopher Nolan really drives home this aspect because he never lets any actor or character rise too high. We don't know their backstories. Name actors like Tom Hardy, Cillian Murphy, Kenneth Branagh, and Mark Rylance are all given small roles. We can't distinguish them from the others. Most of the costume and production design work went into achieving a sort of brown teal look. The actors have dark hair. Even if it's blonde, it's darkened down or concealed. The clothes are mostly similar. In fact, in the first scene, unless you're a World War II specialist, you never know how the French or English differ by their costumes. The story is not about heroism, but about how these characters all essentially do the same thing. Just try to get to the next day until the boats arrive. The colors are muted and somber, unifying all three stories into the larger picture. In many ways, the colors are monotonous, designed to make us tired of them. Tired of waiting until an event like an explosion brings some color and brings us out of our monotony and gets us into survival mode again. The filmmakers went so far as to even not worry about the continuity of the skies. The skies would change quickly in real life and does so on film as well. It's almost as if the camera work were always reacting to the action instead of moving along with it. You can see how the camera moves after the actor or action has, similar to how a documentary cameraman would operate. The camera moves are slow and steady, mostly on a dolly, just following the action. Not trying to make a statement, just being purely functional. Nolan loves to move the camera all the time, and it does add a sense of artificial urgency. Speaking of artificial urgency, you can't ignore the music. By now, this is a Nolan Zimmer motif, 
the ticking time bomb trope. Actually, it has its own logic. It's based on the shepherd tone, which is an audio illusion where the tone seems to go higher and higher, but never really does. Nolan has used this since The Prestige, and for Dunkirk, he wrote the script you with this in mind. Be. For the three stories, land, sea, and air, he positioned the music to increase in intensity until the climax. He also recorded the ticking sound on a watch he owns, and that was the basis for the audio track. Literally, the clock is ticking for these soldiers to escape. Finally, we come to the editing and structure. Lee Smith, the editor, edits as the movie is shot. Nolan watches dailies the old-fashioned way, but rarely watches the rough edit unless there's a problem. If you study the timeline of Dunkirk, you'll see how the land scenes get shorter and shorter until they sort of merge with the sea scenes. Air merges with both sea and land as well. There is a sort of mathematical basis to this edit. I'll provide just one cool example. For most of the movie, the order of the edit is land, moonstone, then air. The scenes in the skies always follow that of the moonstone, with only two exceptions, and those exceptions are instructive. The first time, one of the Spitfires needs to crash in water and the pilot is on the verge of drowning. Here, air becomes one with sea. From then on, we continue the earlier formula of land, sea, air until the climax, when the land and sea have merged. The rescue has taken place, but there's one more battle left, one more bullet left to be fired. I can't reveal more without giving away the story, so please watch the movie if you haven't already, and you'll understand it. You can see how Nolan carefully constructs the structure of the three storylines until they merge seamlessly. You're never aware of it because it happens in waves. There are many other surprises like this, like for example how each storyline is introduced by the characters running into the scene, or how the cuts match from one storyline to the next, but I'll let you explore those nuggets on your own. You think Dunkirk is a slow edit, but nope. Just like with any other Christopher Nolan film, it's an illusion. The average shot length is less than 4 seconds, similar to any action movie. He has managed to make a film about waiting exciting. Check out the link below for my notes and any extra information not in this video, including my mini review of the movie. Hit like if you've enjoyed this. These videos take a lot of time and energy to make. Without your continual support and encouragement, they won't exist. Please subscribe for more cool videos like this one. Bye now. Seriously, I love Tom Hardy, but why on earth do directors hire him just so they can put a mask on him? What do you see?